President Zimmer, Provost Isaacs, faculty, colleagues, graduating students, families, and friends. It is an honor to address you at this convocation. This event not only marks a transition for students, it also recalls 125 years of university history, including many generations of scholars, teachers, and other curious people. We can all feel today as if we've been a small part of that history. Almost 30 years ago, I stood in this exact spot receiving my PhD in anthropology with my parents in the audience marveling that one of us, for the first time in our large family, had received an advanced degree. By that time, the University of Chicago had trained me in one of its noble traditions, critical social research. I had learned slowly to reason with discipline and to study with care. So to those of you who are leaving this community now, I cannot resist offering some advice. Take care and go slow. This is homely advice, much like that your parents and grandparents would urge on you as you're heading out the door, especially if you're driving. Take care and go slow. Why care? Why go slowly? Amid all the urgencies and crises of our time, when domestic security seems more important than global engagement, when science fiction is more appealing than science, when boastful ignorance gathers more media attention than sober information, when short-term gain is preferred over long-term cultivation, when the quick factoid is so much easier to collect than anything that might be more deeply true, why should we bother to care every day in many small ways about our environment, our communities, faraway places, views expressed in foreign languages? Why should we still discipline ourselves to slow and thoughtful investigation? Why should all of us in and outside of the academy care enough to take the time every day in many small ways to study and study some more, to think and think again? When not quite 30 years ago I was here in Rockefeller Chapel getting my degree, I had been teaching in the college core for most of a year. I taught two sections of self-culture and society as a Harper Fellow and I've taught in that sequence many times since. In self, as it's sometimes called, we teach classic social theory, economics, sociology, anthropology, psychology, history, critique. And yes, I did say theory. I'm sure all of you have seen the t-shirt. That's well enough in practice, but how does it work in theory? That's so University of Chicago. In that year of teaching self, I decided to include an essay by the mid-20th century Italian philosopher and anti-fascist activist, Antonio Gramsci. Writing from Mussolini's prison, Gramsci made a distinction between common sense and good sense. He argued that in certain respects, everyone is already a philosopher, whether we intend to be one or not. Even when we make no effort, we are already participants in the common sense philosophy that is contained in our language. Language imposes its unconscious notions and concepts on us, he said. There is a mundane common sense that is haphazard and disconnected. Gramsci says we are all products of a historical process that has left an infinity of traces gathered together without the advantage of an inventory. But his essay insists that we could all be better philosophers, moving beyond mere common sense. With more attention to history and a deeper engagement in the long and difficult task of thinking rationally, we could work out our own conception of the world consciously and critically. We could choose our own sphere of activity and participate actively in the history of the world. Gramsci in all his writings devoted close attention to history and his writings raised many questions that historians, sociologists, and anthropologists later followed up with social research some of it in the noble University of Chicago tradition. Social research is a form of collective reasoning of the conscious and critical sort Gramsci advocated, and it is slow. Could slowness be a virtue? There's a much more recent philosopher now being taught in my department, Isabel Stengers, who argues as much. Stengers, like Gramsci, is also a historian, but she was trained as a scientist. Her first major works were authored with Ilya Prigozhin, a physical chemist, and her, in her more recent writings about the sciences, she has insisted that certain habits of work and thought set the basic sciences apart from ordinary common sense. Instead of challenging the claims of scientific research to provide us with reliable facts about nature, 
as some popular critics have done. Stengers has called on all of us, scientists, philosophers, citizens, to slow down. Here's the opening sentence of one of her influential articles. How can we present a proposal intended not to say what is or what ought to be, but to provoke thought, a proposal that requires no other justification than the way it is able to slow down reasoning and arouse a slightly different awareness of the problem and situations mobilizing us? What kinds of problems and situations did she have in mind? What would a slightly different awareness of these urgent situations look like? There are a few examples referred to in our article, but it's easy for us to supply our own. Even in our American bubble, we're becoming inured to scientific and humanitarian crisis, gun violence, melting glaciers and rising oceans, acute global infections, a chronic state of war in too many places. Sometimes we feel that we've run out of ways to think about these crisis situations. We are hyper aware not only of emergencies, but of our own ignorance about the real reasons for them. We watch our leaders organize action, and we feel collectively like idiots. In fact, Stengers proposes that we pay more attention to the idiots among us. Borrowing from Dostoevsky and Melville, she describes the idiot as the one who always slows the others down, who resists the consensual way in which the situation is presented, and who has doubts about the ways thought or action are demanded in rapid response. This word idiot impresses me as a pretty good description of some of your professors here, and some of you may agree. Having read Stengers, though, I'm tempted to declare that I am an idiot and proud of it. It is the work of the idiot to ask with Stengers, what are we busy doing with our weapons, our biotechnology, our fossil fuels, our information technology? What's the point? What do we hope to accomplish beyond putting out fires? It is the work of the idiot to insist in college classes, in careful scholarship, in laboratory and field research, in public forums, that there is something more important than the panicky urgencies that fill the airwaves. Stenger's idiot insists on this, even though she cannot be certain what it is exactly that is more important. The idiot slows down reason so that bigger questions can be asked, so that public problems can be taken at a different pace and with slightly different results. Like Gramsci's everyman, the philosopher understands what it is to be, for a time, an idiot. Good sense is not lazy like common sense. It is not an easy job being an idiot. The philosopher with good sense devotes time and effort to learning. She brings a hard-won preference for coherence or reasoning to the task of acting in a crisis. As students and scholars, it has taken some time for all of us to get to this day in this place. We have read the many positions taken in many debates. We have improved our methods of gathering and evaluating information. We have struggled with ways to justify and refine our intuitions. We have interrogated the design of experiments, and we have wrangled works of art into existence. This has been deliberate work. It has been slow reasoning. Now that you're graduating, will this deliberateness continue? Is there any place for slow reasoning in your futures? in your new positions as professionals, scientists, creators, teachers, entrepreneurs, administrators, public servants of all kinds and all over the world, will the University of Chicago's particular brand of idiocy still be required? It will if you care and if you take care. Let me close then with another proposal, one that sits comfortably alongside Gramsci's appeal for good sense and Stanger's call to slow down reasoning. This comes from Michel Foucault in an interview published under the title The Masked Philosopher. Curiosity, he says, is a new vice that has been stigmatized by Christianity, by philosophy, and even by a certain conception of science. Curiosity is too often a synonym for futility. The word, however, pleases me. To me, it suggests concern. It evokes the care one takes for what exists and could exist, a readiness to find strange and singular what surrounds us a tendency to break up our familiarities and to regard the same things otherwise, a fervor to grasp what is happening. He goes on, I dream of a new age of curiosity. We have the technical means for it. The desire is there. The things to be known are infinite. The people who can employ themselves at this task exist. We must multiply the paths 
and the possibilities of comings and goings. Foucault dreams of a new age of curiosity, of care, of concern. Having been both student and teacher at the University of Chicago and having been encouraged in that University of Chicago way to indulge my curiosity and to regard the same things otherwise again and again, I believe with him that all of us not only have the desire to continue to learn, but we have the technical means for it. Multiplying the comings and goings of our knowledge and our reasoning is slow and careful work. As we disperse, many of you, to new lives of effective work in many fields, let me urge you again, take care and go slow. <laughs>